I have charcoal styles. He's an independent game developer, and after working as a professional on three successful games as a designer, fate intervened to push him towards independent development. In the intervening three years, he's developed eight games and numerous prototypes over a variety of platforms. His games have been featured in many places, including print magazines in Russia, blogs in America, and competitions in China. Please welcome Alan Starks. So hi everyone, I'm Aaron Chuckle Styles. Chuckle is my middle name, and I make games. I'll be presenting a kind of chronological order of games that influenced me. So um, it should click over soon, and then we can get started. <laughs> Hopefully. Okay, so some of my first memories are of uh, games on our Commodore 64. So when I was very young, we had a Commodore 64 with many, many games, most of them pirated. And international soccer was one of the ones that I played quite often. The AI was very, very bad in it, and I would intentionally thrash the AI um, quite often, 20 to zero. Um, and it would make me feel like a sporting god, which is something I couldn't do in real life being a hemophiliac. Another game that we played quite often was Gauntlet. Um, one time, a whole Saturday afternoon, my mum and I played to see how far we could get. We were stopped at level 127 by the game freezing on the loading screen. Whether it was a counter overflow, some uh, overheated hardware or bad luck, I'm not sure. And while it's not a game, I remember my stepfather trying to, and partially succeeding in trying to teach me the basics of programming in BASIC. Um, one time we spent, again, another afternoon, he would uh, get out some graph paper and try and draw a picture and do all the pokes that we needed to get a display on screen, and then I would just wipe it and do a um, print line and go to 10 loop. Um, <laughs> Now here's the, the um, what you need is an um, embarrassing picture of yourself in the top like this. <laughs> so um, when I was around seven, we didn't have a TV for about a month. During that time, about every night, we would sit um, around and play board games or card games. It was a very influential time. Um, one of the games that I, um, one after Sunday afternoon, I played Pop-Up Pirate with my grandfather. Um, for those that don't know, you have a barrel, you put a pirate in the top of it, and you stick knives in. One of the places you stick the knives in makes the pirate pop out. One time, about three games into it, though I sucked the knife in very slowly, the pirate popped out and landed in my grandfather's cup of coffee. <laughs> Splashed everywhere, and we just laughed for like ten minutes on end. And of course, we played lots of Monopoly. Though I think the love of Monopoly rubbed off my brother more than I. At last count, he has four different uh, variations of the game, which all have the same rules. Which I find rather interesting, but he also has another three of Monopoly-based games that have different rules. So not too long after that, we got a Tandy SL1000, which was an IBM clone. A big game for me on that was King's Quest III. Um, exploring the same eight rooms and three outdoor areas was kind of the limit in that because I could never get down the mountain. There was a bit that was blocked that you couldn't see and you needed to go up, otherwise you'd fall to your death. I could never, ever get past that. Another big game was Alley Cat. Yeah. With a simple four colors and a little bit of beeps and bloops, I played this game often. Looking back now, the movement of the cat was very rigid, but when I was playing it, the animation gave me the feeling that it was a sort of a real cat prowling along the fences and clotheslines, eating mouse, more mice, and going into windows and eating fish out of bowls. And again, as is a recurring theme, I programmed in BASIC. This time was MS BASIC, and I made games that were basically no more, nothing more than basic text adventures or even just glorified spreadsheets with a little bit of story. But the big thing was, I made them. Not too long after that, high school started, and a game store opened up near the uh, public library. Not too long after it opened, they had an import Nintendo 64 with an import Mario 64. So I went to the library very often. <laughs> but amazingly, I didn't actually put any much hard, hard homework. I'm sure you can guess what happened there. So not too long after that, my mum decided that to govern my use over um, technology like that, she would buy me Nintendo 64. All that meant was that I had friends over nearly every weekend that I would constantly own in, in GoldenEye 64. Just every single weekend, uh, I'd have at least one friend over and there would be uh, like 10 games played and I would kill everyone in nine of them. <laughs> Not too long after that, um, a science slash IT slash maths teacher, teacher talked to my mum and said, hey, you should buy Aaron a new computer. That was re and some dial-up internet. That was really just so the teacher and I could play total annihilation against each other on the internet <laughs> a few times a week. 
but this was the first game that I actually started modding and made maps for. Next up, you can't see it here, but it is Quake. <laughs> um, so I started playing Quake, quite an awesome game and very dark. <laughs> Um, and after I finished playing the single player, I started making maps for it, and then I started playing mods for it. Um, nothing that anybody here would know, but I made a little mod of a mod that took um, sort of the idea of Matrix and slowed down and had bullet rings and stuff. And then after that, I made Half Life. When I was making Quake levels, I used the same tool that was then picked up by Velt to make Half Life, so the transition there was very smooth. Again, I made some maps, but this time not some mods. Didn't really get much recognition, but did get a couple of maps did get some rotation on um, Australian servers. And then this is a game about Adam. It's a roguelike, like net hack, but much better. <laughs> no graphics, extreme depth of gameplay. The game is just data-driven mechanics playing against each other, um, exactly like net hack, and it's the exact kind of thing that I like to make. So nowadays I'm influenced by a great many games. If you look at my games folder on the right, well, your left, um, it has a whole heap of indie games and my Steam, you see maybe about a third of it there and has a whole heap of games, both indie and you know, full commercial games. I don't care what I play, I just play whatever I get my hands on and it influences me and as you can see in my games. Um, there are elements of every single game I've ever played in all of my games. These are the ones that I've made over the past uh, two years. Um, some of them, some of the influences are very obvious, some of them only really struck me when I put together this presentation. And wait for the next slide. <laughs> um, so, the early levels of Space Defenders, if anybody's played my games, um, makes, recreates a feeling that I had in international soccer. They're very, very simple and you can easily just wipe out everything in them, in that game. Flutterbys is a very physics driven game, reminding me of the fun that I had with Pop-Up Pirate and my grandfather. And I always make sure that there's no game stopping bugs in my game like Gauntlet. Um, a weird and unintentional, and one that I found out only when putting this presentation together, um, is Shmup. Um, has quite a few ties back to Alley Cat. Um, the animation of the circles is very um, fluid, and the limited color palette. Um, and then also Shmup also ties back to the games that I made mods for, or levels for, being XML um, driven and data editable. Thank you. Oh, my God, I'm